Okay, everybody. So this week we're going to talk about elections. We're going to talk about some political parties, and we're going to talk about democracy, and and that's going to involve um, voting and voting demographics, as well as things like primaries. Uh, We'll focus on you know electoral college and uh, voting for president when we get to the executive branch chapter, but um, right now we're just going to kind of talk about how in a sense presidents also get nominations for um by their party okay elections are going to give legitimacy to government so if you look at some of the countries around the world that are maybe authoritarian um a lot of their elections are legitimate because maybe you might only have one choice or maybe you are influenced to vote for a certain party or a certain person um one thing about our elections here even if you don't like the person in power is that our for the most part our elections are legitimate elections choose people not necessary not necessarily policy and we'll get into that in a little bit um choosing people to hold office is the second function of elections all right, and you know parties are involved, and the media is involved. Um, voters usually don't choose policy positions when they are thinking about a candidate they want to vote for. Um, and remember, also we may hear campaign promises that are made by candidates, and they're not bound to those pledges, so sometimes they don't come through. So, why do people vote, and how do people vote here in the United States? So. Uh, the author talks about policy voters. We're going to kind of, you know, remember, kind of reaffirm the fact that this is only a small percentage of the way people vote is based off of a policy. Um, party voters, uh, group benefit voters, and the two common ones, retrospective voters and candidate image voters. So these are the two most used ways that people will decide who they're going to vote for. Sometimes they might want to vote retrospectively, and we'll talk about, you know, maybe using past judgments to assess a person's performance or a party's performance, and that's how we're going to vote for them. Or a candidate's image, you know, somebody's charm, somebody's attractiveness, somebody's speaking ability. That might also be a way that people decide who they are going to vote for. So the book talks about the myth of the policy voter. Um, most voters have no information or opinion about many specific policy issues. I don't want to totally dismiss what uh, the author is trying to convey here because there are people that, you know, you may have a, uh, you know, maybe a, a red flag policy that somebody might be, might cause somebody to not want to vote for a specific candidate, whether it's on, you know, maybe re- women's reproductive rights, uh, pro-life right um, issues, um, same-sex issues, uh, things like that. Um, but they're very, very small. There's a very small number of people that vote that way. Um, candidates frequently mistakenly believe they have a policy mandate. Generally, policy positions will not bring electoral victory. But, you know, in this instance, in 2022, it's going to be interesting to see how Um, Maybe the people in the middle, and we'll kind of go into that later in the slides. Um, The people in the middle, especially women, how they react and how this electorate will react to the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe versus Wade. And is that going to push independent women voters toward the Democrats in the 2022 election, which they think might happen? Sometimes people will wait, you know, Vote based off of an ideology or a party preference. Uh, 36% of the population is going to describe themselves as conservative. 25 are going to describe themselves liberal. And the most important part of the electorate are those 39% who identify as moderates. And the reason being is these are the people that you need to kind of cater to in order to receive their vote. Remember, the magic number to win an election is 51%. So if you have... 36% um, who identify themselves as conservative, you're going to need to get 25% of the moderate vote to put you over that 51% criteria. If you're a liberal, you have a little bit more work to do. You have to garner 26% of the vote. And, you know, we'll talk about something called the vote uh, medium voter theorem a little bit later in in the slides, and it'll kind of show you what I'm talking about. And one thing that is 
pretty much fact here in in our electorate is that we have high levels of party polarization and what this means is kind of the consensus that there are the ability that democrats and republicans can come together and have find common ground on an issue it's about as wide apart ideologically as it's ever been right so the gap between the democrats and the republicans are about as wide as it's ever been and i don't see it kind of maybe getting minimized anytime soon. Sometimes people will just vote based on party. Party identification is a powerful influence on how people vote. There'll be some people that vote for somebody just because they're a Democrat or just because they're a Republican. Uh, And this kind of reinforces what we talk about with this concept of elitism. Uh, The parties reinforce elite consensus and limit political conflict. Um... You know, both parties have supported public-oriented mass welfare programs and basic outlines of U.S. foreign and military policy since World War II. All right, so there are people that vote will vote just based off of party. There's also people that vote based off of a group benefit or a group basis of voting. Um, Democratic voters are deport, deport, disproportionately drawn from labor unions, big city dwellers, people that live in big cities, Jewish people, Catholics, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and African Americans. Republican voters are disproportionately drawn from rural, small town, suburban, Protestant, white business people. Okay, so kind of, you know, uh, on the outs, doing, you know, outside reading um, on my own, um, I've noticed that the Catholic faith, which was kind of a staple of the Democratic Party from the 50s and the 60s um, really have started to kind of realign themselves with the Republican Party. And I think one thing that really matters, though, is kind of levels, what's called levels of religiosity. Okay, so what I'm talking about with that is, you know, the more religious you are, the more likely you're going to be a conservative and a Republican voter. Now, you might be, you know, say somebody like myself, um, what's known as a lapsed Catholic. I was born um, born and baptized in the Catholic religion. Um, but since probably 2010, 2011, I've kind of lost kind of connection with the Catholic Church. Um, so, I mean, you could probably say that I am religious, but I wouldn't say I'm evangelical religious where i go out and proselytize read the bible every day do the rosary um so you know you can have people who maybe are still respectful of the faith and practice maybe basic customs and then you have people that go to church every day take communion um read the bible look at the gospel so i think you can really kind of 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 measure levels of religiosity and kind of figure out where those people are going to vote but for the most part, I think the author is maybe not totally correct in his assertion that Catholics are tied into the Democratic Party. I think more and more, especially since you know the mid-80s up until now when things like abortion has been a really hot topic, same-sex marriage, stem cell research, I think the Catholic religion has slowly realigned itself to the Republican Party. And we'll talk more about realignment in a few minutes. A lot of people vote retrospectively. So what this is, is people will cast past judgments and look back to see past political conduct and see if maybe a change needs to be made. You know, when there's hard economic times like a depression or a recession or a war that has has cost a lot of lives, sometimes the incumbent party will be held responsible for this especially with hard economic times. And we'll see some examples in a little bit. Most voters have really little understanding of economics. We're going to use terms later in this class like supply-side economics. Um, Some people don't know what that is. Um, And, you know, we have biases that exist. And the author talks about having an anti-market bias, having an anti-foreign bias, a make work bias, pessimist bias. So we'll take a look at uh, some of the things as we go on and kind of address those. So when I talk about retrospective voting, um, president, I mean, some examples of this, especially when people are running for president is um, 
you know, wars can be an, a, another issue for retrospective voting. Um, you know, Lyndon Johnson chose not to run for re-election due to kind of the unpopularity of the Vietnam War. Um, the 2004 uh, midterm, or the t- 2004 presidential elections uh, divided the Iraq, uh, divided voters based off of the Iraq War and even the Afghanistan War. Um, 2006 congressional elections, uh, the Republicans lost uh, Congress, and this could be probably be tied into voters' rejection of Bush's Iraq War policy and also his Afghan Afghanistan policy. And one of the things that I also kind of want to focus on is I think President Obama was able to win election because of people voting retrospectively. Because when you think about 2007 going into 2008, what was going on? We had two wars, one in Iraq, one in Afghanistan that didn't, that didn't seem that it wanted to end. We had a very, very bad recession. We had the housing market crashing. So imagine being a person that maybe was... Um, knew somebody that was injured in the war, uh, had was working, lost their job, couldn't pay their mortgage, housing crisis happens, um, lost their home. You know, that person might say, hey, maybe I should, shouldn't should vote Republican again in 2008 for president. Maybe I'm going to give the Democrat a chance. So that's just kind of an, an, an example and an idea that um, can cause somebody to vote retrospectively. Um, and you can kind of see that at times control of Congress will flip back and forth um, between a Republican and a Democrat, Democratic leadership. And, you know, like I said, maybe unpopular policies can cause that. Uh, wars, definitely economic times that are hard. So I think we can probably pretty much understand what we mean by how these affect people's judgments when they go out and vote. People always also like to vote based off of a candidate's image, right? Um, media campaigns emphasize a candidate's image, whether it is um, maybe somebody's ability to speak, maybe somebody's attractiveness, maybe somebody's charisma. And this is one of the more important and less partisan and less ideological ways that these type of voters will use when they're going to cast their vote. And these really, ha- you know, kind of are... are are seen in a presidential election than a congressional election. So when we talk about political parties and elections, you know, when we talk about this from a pluralist theory form, a pluralist theory developed a responsible party model of the U.S. political system where they are supposed to develop and clarify alternative policy positions, educate people on issues, simplify choices, maybe making issues... um, noticeable in a or understandable in a kind of a layperson's term um recruit candidates for office organize and direct campaigns be able to hold election account election officials accountable especially if there are situations where they don't come through on their promises and organize legislatures to ensure party control now if we look at um Problems with this model is parties have been less have less incentive to offer strong positions. Uh, you know, you have to, they like to keep themselves more ambiguous in order to motivate or to appeal to the people in the middle. These parties are oligarchies. Remember, we talked about the iron law of oligarchy in one of the first uh, classes that we had, where that says says in any type of organization, there's going to be an elite that controls that organization and there's going to be the masses who are the greater number of people that don't have a say. And usually these parties are dominated by people that are going to be active, people that are elites, and people that, you know, maybe their views do not res- do not reflect what um, people in the electorate want. Party loyalty among voters has been declining over the years. Um we're seeing a growth in independent voters. People are detaching themselves from parties. We'll talk about those terms in a little bit. Uh, mass media and social media has replaced the party as a means of political communication. Pretty much every politician or candidate is going to have some type of social media account and are, are media savvy. 
and they used it to you know reach out to millions of people instantaneously which is a thing that i kind of we kind of seen in the past maybe 15 years and how effective things like twitter and facebook are used to campaign parties really don't have a way to hold elected officials accountable or responsible and this is going to be one thing that i disagree with um the author we're going to look at a specific example the author says that primary elections primary elections are elections where parties determine who they want to run for an office in a general election so uh, a few months ago in california we had our primaries to see who will run for you know congressional offices and in some instances senate um the top the candidates who are chosen go and run in the general election so what the author is saying is primary elections undermine the power of party organizations and party elites that may be true with a congressional election but when we talk about the president i'm going to show you an instance where this might not totally be true okay let's talk a little bit about parties and then we'll go into talking about primaries and single member districts and direct senator elections and stuff like that so at the beginning or the onset of the united states in the colonial period we had uh, two parties um the federalist party which was formed by alexander hamilton which favored a strong national government and the democratic republican party which was an anti which was an american political party formed by jefferson and madison and they favored more state influence in the federal government as opposed to having a strong national government so going kind of going through the history here we had the era of good feeling uh this was a period between 1817 and 1825 um marked a period in political history where the United States had a sense of national purpose and they wanted to unify Americans after the War of 1812. We had the Anti Mason Party that developed from 1827 to 1828. This was as a this was happened as a result of the disappearance of Willem Morgan, who was a Freemason who was planning to publish a book with re which revealed the secrets of the order uh freemasons were was a member of a major fraternal organization called free and accepted masons or agent free accepted mason accepted masons that had certain rituals basically is a secret society that a lot of elites belong to after the election of 1836 however the anti-masonic party declined and together with the National Republican Party, eventually absorbed into the new Whig Party. Now we're going to talk about the Whig Party. The Whig Party, um, an American political party formed in the 1830s to oppose President Andrew Jackson and the Democrats. Now when we hear the terms Democrats and, and Republicans in the next few slides, they're going to be vastly different than what we know them to be now. The Whig sto stood for protective tariffs, right? A tariff is a tax imposed by the government of a country on imports. So say, for instance, if we're importing a good, we're going to put a tax on that good um, if, uh, in order to probably try to get somebody in our country to be able to develop that product cheaper than it is to import it. So it's kind of a way to protect... Uh, um, United States uh, merchandise commerce um, products. Um, they favored a national uh, banking system. A national bank is a commercial bank that's chartered by the U.S. Treasury Department and also federal aid for internal improvements within the country. Their basis of support came from entrepreneurs or business owners, professionals, planters, people who wanted to reform so, so, to society, um, devout Protestants, and the emergency, the emerging urban middle class. 
The party eventually kind of fizzled out by uh, the question of whether to allow the expansion of slavery to the territories. Uh, the anti-slavery faction successfully prevented the nomination of its own incumbent president, uh, President Fillmore, in the 1852 presidential election. This voter base then defected to the Republican Party and various coalition parties on the in some states to the Democratic Party. Remember, these are going to be different than what the parties we know as the Republican and Democratic parties today. So during Reconstruction, um, the Republican Party was founded in northern states in 1854 by anti-slavery activists. Um, and it was in opposition to the dominant Democratic Party and also the Know Nothing Party or a Nativist Party, which we'll talk about. Uh, their slogan was free labor, free land, free men. They stood for the gold standard or having a monetary system in which the standard unit of currency is fixed quantity of gold or is kept at the value of a fixed quantity of gold. So kind of tie in. Um, the unit of currency to how much gold is worth. Also, high tariffs on imports to stimulate economic growth. Remember, if you put a high tariff on an import, you might encourage somebody within your country to be able to produce that product at a cheaper price. Also created programs such as free homestead farms, the Homestead Act, um, subsidized railroads, and created a new banking system uh, creating uh, and also created a new welfare state. During this time, you know, there was uh, parties were called Tweedledee and Tweedledum, uh, two persons or organizations deemed indistinguishable in some way. But when we talk about that, this is kind of a fallacy, and the parties are going to be vastly different in beliefs and ideologies. The Republican Party tend to favor national unity modernizing the economy and a moral reform. At this time, the Democratic Democratic Party was actually pro-slavery and the disenfranchisement of African Americans, um, but still attracted immigrants to their party, whether it's uh, Italian or Irish immigrants, which also led to a nativist movement. Uh, nativism is the political position of preserving status for certain Establish inhabitants of a nation as compared to claims of newcomers or immigrants. And they believe the best way to prevent the spread of inferior people in the United States was by controlling or restricting immigration. Kind of a very, very nationalistic point of view. One culture, one language. It was traditionally anti-Irish Catholic, anti-German, anti-Chinese, anti-Mexican, and at times we also had movements where we had quotas that were used for immigration, and a special formula was actually used to determine how many people would be let into the country. The Immigration Act of 1924 even took it further by lowering quotas of people you could let into the United States. When we talked about Teddy Roosevelt last uh, week, we talked about the Bull Moose Party. We kind of didn't go in great detail of it, but it kind of set it up for what we were going to talk about today or this week. Uh, the Bull Moose Party was a former political party that was founded by Teddy Roosevelt during his presidential campaign of 1912. Um, its emblem was a picture of a bull moose. Um, the 1896 realignment cemented the Republicans as the party of big business which added more small business support by his embracement of trust busting, which we talked about during the Progressive Era. It's also called the Progressive Party. We had a lot of progressive reforms. And remember the acts that were put into place, the laws that were put into place to kind of rein in, rein in capitalist. This party eventually fizzled out, and a lot of these people eventually joined FDR's New Deal Party. And the New Deal Party, or the New Deal Democrats, were kind of a bit of a preview of what we came to know as the Democratic Party today. And we're going to see coalitions break off and, in a sense, form the Republican Party of what we've seen today. So, 
The New Deal coalition was an alignment of interest groups and various voting blocs in the United States that supported the New Deal. Remember, the New Deal was put into place to fight the Great Depression. And they voted for the Democratic presidential candidates from 1932 all the way up until 1960 when Nixon, 1968 when Nixon was elected president. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt moved his a lot of his ideology and party to the left and started the practice of something called modern liberalism, which we talked about when we talked about ideologies. Remember, somebody that might be, well, now might be pro-choice, pro-same-sex marriage, um, in favor of a welfare state, maybe in some instances a redistribution of the wealth. A lot of Roosevelt's um, programs and a lot of his actions practice federal activism. New federal agencies attempt to control agricultural productions, trying to an attempt to stabilize wages and prices, uh, creating a vast public works program for the unemployed, um, which included maybe building buildings, um, uh, bridges, public works projects to help get people back to work. And also unemployment insurance was put into place as kind of a safety net. So if people were out of work, um, they would be able to receive money until they could get a regular full-time job. He also created the Social Security Act, uh, the Social Security program that we have today. The Social Security Act of 1935 um, make, creates a system where money where money is given to people who are no longer able to work. And there's a variety of programs within Social Security that can that could assist people if they are no longer able to work. Uh, generally, the most common time is when people turn 62. 65, 67, or 70, you can retire at these ages. Um, obviously, if you work until 70, you're going to get more money out of Social Security than if you retire at 62. Uh, if you look at your paycheck and you see the term FICA, OAS, that is the in, that is the Social Security tax that we pay. And when we pay t- into it, we get credits. And when we get credits and qualify, for Social Security, the longer we work and the more we put into it, the more money that we're going to get out when it's time for us to retire. Now, there's also a couple of other programs that Social Security has. One is a Social Security disability insurance. So if a doctor declares that you can no longer work, you can get Social Security payments for that way. Um, if you have a spouse or a parent pass away, uh, and you're of a certain age, if you're a, a, a child, you can receive survivor benefits. So just a variety of programs to protect people where they might have something terrible that happens in their, in their, um, in their life to give them kind of a safety net. And then also protecting people who can no longer physically work as well. And this whole program focuses on relief, recovery, and reform. And the members of this party included Democratic State Party organizations, city machines, uh, labor unions, blue-collar workers, uh, minorities, farmers, um, white Southerners, people on relief, and intellectuals. The New Deal programs and FDR civil rights stance brought many people to the party. It was never officially a party, but evolved into what we see now as the Democratic Party. Now, with that being said, it may have brought a lot of people to the party, but it also alienated people. Um, Unfortunately for the Democrats, the twin forces of the civil rights movement and the hippie counterculture caused a fracture in the party in the northern states. Uh, Many blue-collar voters who were conservative did not like kind of that youth counterculture coming up and the civil rights movement uh, caused them to eventually become what is today we know as the Republican Party. Included in this are people known as Dixiecrats. States' rights Democratic Party was a short-lived segregationist political party in the United States. It originated in 1948 as a faction of the Democratic Party that determined to protect state rights to, and for them to be able to legislate 
racial segregation from what its members regarded as an oppressive federal government. So basically what they believed was that the state should have the say in whether or not they want to create laws with regards to segregating the races. They wanted to keep Jim Crow laws and white supremacy. When we get to the civil rights uh, area of this class, we'll talk a little bit more about Jim Crow laws. Um, Strom Thurmond, he was a senator that represented South Carolina for 48 years. He was in power uh, and senator of South Carolina from 1953 to 2003 when he was 101 years old. He was a founding member of that party and he ran for president in, 18, in 1948. George Wallace, former governor of Alabama, ran for president in 1968, 72, and 76. If you um, have seen the movie Forrest Gump, there's a scene where they are desegregating the University of Alabama. And a young lady is blocked by a, an individual um, in uh, kind of the doorstep that's preventing her from going into the building. Uh, that was George Wallace. And um, he was um, um, trying to make a statement uh, how he felt it was, uh, his feeling was that he wasn't too um, happy with the government coming in and trying to force segregation on the state of Alabama. Um, an assassination attempt in 1972 left him in a wheelchair. And soon after that, he sought redemption, especially when it was found that he had fathered a child with um, an African-American woman. So we also kind of see the rise of the Republicans after the New Deal. Uh, this Republican Party was based on northern white Protestants, businessmen, business owners, professionals, blue-collar workers, factory workers, farmers, and African-Americans. Again, it was a pro-business um, party, supported the banks, the gold standard that we talked about earlier, uh, railroads, high tariffs to protect factory workers, and the growth of industry, and the concept of industrialization. The New Deal Democrats coalition collapsed partly because of those Dixiecrats feelings on um, the civil rights movement. Um, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are now kind of what we know them to be today. And from 68 to 88, the, Demo the Republicans won five of the six presidential elections with Ronald Reagan as kind of that party's iconic conservative hero. From 92 to, 20 to 2016, the Republican candidate has been elected to the White House in three of the seven presidential elections. The Republican Party, or the GOP, expanded its base throughout the South after 68, largely due to... Uh, you know, being able to appeal among socially conservative individuals, white evangelical Protestants, and traditional Roman Catholics. And we would use the word evangelical. Those are generally people that are very strong in their religion, and they go out and proselytize, which means they go out and preach to people, maybe try to get them to convert. And we go to church every day, read skip scripture. Same thing with traditionalist Roman Catholics. Um, we've had kind of also... Um, what we can call not we can call factions within the party. Um, for many years, there was the religious right, which is still a very strong part of the Republican Party, uh, along with the moral majority. Uh, the Tea Party, who were uh, small government individuals that um, wanted as small a government as possible, and has kind of led into the Freedom Caucus, which we still see exists today. You know. Um, laissez-faire economic type belief, small government, adherence to traditional values, uh, spreader of democracy, and supply-side economics, which is kind of that trickle-down economic theory that we'll actually get more into when we talk about Reagan, and we'll explain supply-side economics a little bit more. Basically, kind of as a, uh, as a little bit of a teaser, um, supply-side econ economics is the belief that you cut um, taxes on the rich, and what the rich are saving, they're going to, um, that money is going to trickle down to the lower earners in society. So just kind of that belief, trickle down economics or supply side economics. And we'll talk more about that when we get to Reagan. Now, one of the newer parties that was founded in um, the 90s was uh, the Reform Party. 
And this was founded by Ross Perot. Ross Perot was a very charismatic Texas billionaire with this really, really thick Texas accent. Uh, he ran for president in 1992, and he received 19% of the popular vote. This is a very, very impressive number for a third-party candidate here in the United States. Um, another individual who was a Reform Party member was Jesse Ventura. He is a former wrestler and an actor. A quick piece of trivia for you to know. The movie Predator has two governors in it. One is Jesse Ventura. The other one is Arnold Schwarzenegger. So there's a little bit of, good, a little bit of trivia there. Um, he was elected governor of Minnesota in 1998. They focused on fiscal issues such as reducing the federal deficit, eliminating national debt, reforming government by instituting term limits, uh, campaign finance reform, and lobbying reform. And remember, um, when you kind of look at interest groups, we see a lot of money that was going from interest groups and to into candidates' um, um, campaigns. Uh, lobbying reform, we saw that video about Jack Abramoff, which was kind of surprising, right? And also focused on issues with trade and, and also maybe trying to keep jobs here in the United States. Um, one of his more famous comments was that um, uh, we started to see kind of with some of the trade policies that are happening, specifically one called NAFTA that um, was um, being put into place is the concept of a giant sucking sound. Um we have to. We have got to stop sending jobs overseas. It's pretty simple. If you're paying twelve, thirteen, fourteen an hour for factory workers, and you can move your factory south of the border, pay a dollar an hour for labor, have no health care. That's the most single. Um, that's the most expensive single element in making a car. Have no environmental protections, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money. There will be a giant sucking sound going south. Basically, what he's saying is that all these jobs are going to start heading down to Mexico where you don't have to pay a person $14 an hour. They'll be happy with a dollar an hour. Um, when Mexico's jobs come up from a dollar an hour to $6 an hour, ours will go down to $6 an hour and then it's level again. But in the meantime, you wreck the country with these kinds of deals. So just kind of his, his um, rhetoric and he was a very, very popular individual. The party started to die off in the 2000s as Pat Buchanan and David Duke joined the party. At one time, Trump was a member, but Trump was also a Democrat at one time as well. Um, I don't know if you know Pat Buchanan or David Duke. Pat Buchanan is a very conservative pundit. Um, he ran for president. We'll see how he affected the 2000 election when we get to the Electoral College. Um, but he is also a Holocaust denier. So, uh, obviously, that's not going to make him too popular. Uh, David Duke, at one time, was Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. So, you know, a couple individuals that may lessen the appeal of that party to other individuals. Um, Buchanan ran for president in 2004 um, and failed to receive at least 5% of the vote. Therefore, he, he, the, the, the party lost its federal matching funds. So, um, when you go and file your taxes... Um, there is a box that says, uh, do you want to contribute $3 to presidential campaigns? Uh, that money put, is put in a pool, and then um, a president, presidential candidate is given uh, by the federal government uh, um, the amount of money to match the money that they have raised personally. But you need to have gotten 5% of the vote in a general election. Now, let's look at demographics a little bit. Okay, when we look at voting behavior, and this is going to include leaning, right? I wanted to consolidate the numbers a little bit. So generally, men are going to tend to be more Republican than women. Uh, women are going to be more Republican, I mean, more Democratic than men. Whites are going to tend to be more Republican than blacks. And if you click on that link, it's going to show you um, party identification in greater detail. But we also have slides here that are going to show uh, kind of ethnic minorities as well. Uh, generally, whites, like we said, are going to be either Republican or lean Republican more than blacks. 
Hispanics are going to definitely be more Democrats than um, Republican. Um, but then again, you know, you also kind of have to look at this, um, especially with Latinx people, is what type of Latinx people are they? A Mexican American is going to be a lot more liberal than a Cuban American. And if you look at some of the voting demographics down in maybe South Florida, uh, Cuban Americans, like I said, tend to be a lot more Republican uh, due to maybe, you know, kind of that traditional stance against uh, communism. A lot of their families might have fled communism um, under the Castro regime and came to the United States and, and may fear that that type of ideology would filter into the United States as well. Asians tend to be a little bit more democratic than whites as well. And then if you look at this, you can also see um, this re, re, um, this website about, uh, you know, kind of what type of work um, more people, our people might be with regards to their political party. Um, you know, union, organize, union, organize, union organizer, easy for me to say, sorry about that. Um, they're going to tend to be a little bit more democratic than, say, a missionary or somebody that's an evan evangelical Christian. Scientist versus a logger. And it just looks at um, kind of the differences. You can look at it on your own. Um, and here's the methodology. We can get some of these pop-up ads out of the way. And it'll just show you. All right. Also, another good predictor of um, party membership or party identification is age. Older people are going to tend to be more Republican than younger people. And if you can see the charts here, you can see how that is kind of reaffirmed, right? So older people are going to tend to lean more, be Republican or lean more Republican than Democratic. And then younger people who tend to lean more Democratic. So currently we have the Democratic Party here, the Republican Party. We also have third parties. And third parties really, really do not have an effect on elections at the federal level. And one of the reasons why is third parties fail because of lack of ballot access. The Libertarian Party is the third. They're the strongest third party, the biggest third party here in the United States, but they're only on 33 ballots here in the 50 states. The Green Party, which is a, a left-leaning party, uh, they're 22. They're on 22 ballots here in the in the United States, and the Constitution Party is on 13. So these parties really, really don't get that much of effect on. They really don't have that much of an effect on national elections. Uh, because of this ballot access problem and the libertarian party is probably the biggest and if you take it you know if you want to get a chance um, we talked a little bit about libertarian party ideologies um, in the ideology section where a libertarian is going to tend to be more um, socially liberal and economically conservative when you get a chance click on this link look at a libertarian's views on abortion same-sex adoption um National debt and public pensions. So those are kind of a good good uh, points to look at and and see, um, you know how they are going to tend to be socially liberal but economically conservative. We're also seeing a declining attachment to parties. So the percentage of voters preferring neither party has really grown. This concept is called dealignment. And dealignment is when we have a decline of attractiveness of both parties. So a dealignment would be when somebody leaves the Republican Party, leaves the Democratic Party, and become independents. We also have the concept of realignment. Realignment occurs when the social group profile of the party changes. Remember earlier how I talked about the Catholic vote and how it's kind of gone from the Democratic Party to the Republican parties? Uh, so Catholics have realigned themselves from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. That's an, that's an example of realignment. 
So this is when the hap this happens when one party changes from uh, or one demographic group changes from one party to another. So Calix have gone from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. Both party nominees must appeal to the center. Remember when we said that um, 39% of the public identifies as a, an independent voter or a person in the middle? Um, strong ideological and policy positions are counterproductive except to mobilize strong partisans to turn out to vote. So this is what something that I want you to kind of understand here. All right, so let's look at this. So we have liberals on one side, conservatives on the other, right? Kind of a traditional political spectrum. So remember, by our figures that we talked about earlier, right? We have 25% of the population here, 39% of the population here in the middle. So what needs to be done is the candidate who is liberal needs to move themselves along the ideological spectrum toward those middle voters to attract them but they can't go so far so far over that they alienate their base right so basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw yourself to the middle and you attract the voters in the middle because you need 26 percent of the 39 percent here to win your election remember this is 25 percent liberal right so in the middle, we're going to need to attract 26% of the voters from that demographic to vote for our candidate. And it works the other way as well. Remember, 39% of the population identifies as conservative. You're going to need to attract a smaller number, 12%, um, or what was it, 36%. You're going to need to attract what 15% out of that 39% um, to vote. For you, so that's kind of positioning yourself along the ideological spectrum to a point where you can attract the voters in the middle without losing your base, or your, or from your twenty-five percent here under liberal, or your thirty-six percent under conservative. Very interesting detail here, and this is something that is kind of a little bit of a core of political science called the Median Voter Theorem. Okay, everybody, I just wanted to kind of give you a visual of this the Median Voter Theorem that we talked about. Um, it was kind of hard to do it on that other PowerPoint, so let's go ahead and draw it out here on a whiteboard. So remember, we have, according to the text, we have 25% of the population that identifies themselves as liberal. We have 36% that identifies themselves as conservative. That leaves us with 39% of the population in the middle. All right, so for the sake of argument, we're going to say that we have two candidates. So your magic number to win is going to be 51%. So we need 50 plus one or 51% to win the election. All right, so this theorem says that a candidate has to move themselves along the ideological spectrum to be able to attract these 39% voters here without alienating these 25% voters here. So say we're candidate one and we have a liberal here, right? Okay, so say that we're right here. We got our 25%, right? We have to attract and move along the ideological spectrum to attract 26% of voters out of that 39 in order to get the magic number, which is 51%. All right, so again, let's do it one more time. So we're at 25. We have to move ourselves along the spectrum to attract 26% of the voters out of this 39. Sorry, there's a limitation on the whiteboard here. I can't get this little two bar out. So uh, just do that, see, and it just gets doesn't work. So um, we have to attract that 26%, all right? Um, we'll look at it at the other side. All right. So we have our base right here. We don't have to move ourselves as much along the ideological spectrum because remember, we have 11% more of 
the voters that identify themselves as conservative, according to the text. So we have to move ourselves along the ideological spectrum just enough to garner 15 percent so we can hit 51 we can't move ourselves so far that we're going to alienate this 36 percent. So we have to just be able to find kind of the medium where we go and attract just enough voters to get up to that 51 percent without alienating this 36 percent. So in our instance here. Um, we need 15 percent. But on this side, we got a little bit more work to do. Right. We're going to need 26 percent. All right. So again, like we'll look at the candidates. Candidate one's a liberal. We need to get 26% more people out of this 39. So we have to move ourselves along the ideological spectrum without alienating the 25% here and losing votes. Okay, that's basically it. I think it helped us, you know, kind of write it out and see um, how this works in all actuality. Okay, thanks a lot. Remember, we talked about why third parties fail. Most third parties are formed to promote an ideology or to resist a protest. And for the most part, remember, they don't have ballot access or enough ballot access. We have single member districts here in the United States, right? The House of Representatives is an example. We vote for somebody to represent our district. Districts in the U.S. are split into these separate districts, we have 435 of them. We have primary elections generally that are held in June for the midterms, in some cases March. And the top vote getters from each party moved on to the general election, which will happen in November. Candidate who receives a plurality during the, number, during the November vote will win the election. So the Republicans will, will have a primary. The Democrats will have a primary. Who wins those primaries will face each other in a general election in November. I mean, this is what we're going to be seeing in, in the midterms in 2022. We also have direct elections here. And this is almost the same as single-member districts, but this involves the elections of senators. Uh, the 17th Amendment actually gave us the ability to vote for our senators. Remember, prior to that, State legislatures voted for the senators, but bef but by the 17th Amendment, per, per the 17th Amendment, we now vote for the senators directly. In California, the top two vote getters in the primary election will go on to face each other in the general election, no matter what the party they belong to. 2016 California Senate is a good example where we had two Democrats Kamala Harris, who is currently our vice president, and Lorena Sanchez, who is a labor leader, were the top two vote getters in the primaries, and they voted, I mean, they were running against each other in the general election in November. So primary elections decide the party's nominee for, for public office. Usually there's not a lot of turnout in primary elections. The percentage could be anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. Presidential elections are about 60%. The 2020 presidential election had about a 69% uh, percentage rate of people that participated. So 69% of um, registered voters voted in that presidential election in 2020. Now, this may, that's actually a very good number, but it still tells you that there's 31% of the people that didn't participate. And also you can maybe infer that um, it might be a hard number to be able to establish, but I don't know how you would do it if you try to figure out how many people are 18 U.S. citizen able to vote but not registered. Primarily strengthen the influence of the ideological activists in each party. However, image, like always, or retrospective voting often, often trumps over triumphs over ideology. Um, for president, the nomination process begins with the Iowa caucuses in January in the primary in New Hampshire. Usually this is in January and February. It provides an opportunity for the media to separate serious candidates from the rest. Um, and remember, uh, this uh, author says that political party elites cannot control the selection of candidates. Um, I, I'm going to show you a way that they can. All right. And this is primarily going to be through the Democratic Party. So Iowa in 2016, Clinton and Cruz were the winners, Ted Cruz and Hillary Clinton. 
New Hampshire were Trump and Sanders, who uh, Trump was the, was the one who eventually got the nomination and Clinton got the Democratic nomination. Iowa in 2020, the Democratic winner was Biden. So let's look at 2016 because I kind of wanted to show you this. Well, actually, we'll come back to this. So the way the Democratic Party does the nomination process for president is they use pledge delegates and a concept called super delegates. All right. A candidate for the Democratic nomination must win a majority of combined delegate votes at the Democratic National Convention. Of the 4,765 total dem uh, uh, Democratic delegates, 714 of those are super delegates. And these are individual people, usually Democratic members of Congress, governors, former presidents, other party leaders, and elected officials, or also a better way to frame this are, is the term party elites. So we're going to look at 2016 in a minute. Okay, so the Democratic Party uses a proportional representation to determine how many delegates each candidate is awarded in each state. A candidate who receives 40% of a state's vote in the primary election will receive 40% of those state's delegates. So if there's 100 delegates available and one candidate wins 60, the other wins 40, um, the candidate who won 60% is going to get 60 delegates. The a candidate that won 40% um, percent is going to or is going to get 40 delegates. However, a candidate must at least win at least 15% of the primary vote in order to receive any delegate and it's just a simple majority. Remember this Sanders Clinton thing, we're going to come back to it, but let's go back to our New York Times link here. And this is going to link up This is going to link up to um the New York Times website, and it's going to give our delegate count right here. So we're not going to worry about the Republicans. They do it a little bit simpler. Let's look at the Democrats. So we have Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. All right. So you can see here Hillary Clinton won 2,220 regular delegates. You need 2,383 to win. So you can see right here. It didn't give her enough to win the nomination alone. So Hillary needed the assistance of the superdelegates. Remember, these are individual people, party elites. So in a sense, remember when the author said that party elites cannot control the primary and who wins it? And I beg to differ with that. Because as you can see here, out of that 714, 591 supported Hillary Clinton. And that pushed her past the 2,383 that was needed to win. Now, if you want to play like kind of Monday morning quarterback or a, you know, a retrospective look on this, if you would have flipped the 591 and the four, and gave those to Bernie, Bernie would have won the nomination then. So, and you could see here that the super delegates controlled who received the nomination. So that's why I say I don't necessarily agree with the author on that point. And I just wanted to show you. And you can look at here um, by state. It'll show you the total number of delegates that the each candidate won. The Democrats are on the, on the right. The Republicans are on the left. And it goes by state. And it's actually by voting... Um, uh, date the date that the election was handled or was was conducted so that's what i just wanted to show you right so you know um another thing that is kind of reaffirms what i'm trying to um uh address with you is you know in 2016 there was accusations that the dnc the democratic national committee sandbagged the bernie sanders campaign uh, there was a WikiLeaks hack that hacked into the DNC's email server, and they found emails where the DNC was badmouthing the Sanders campaign. The DNC chief financial officer suggested that the media should ask Sanders if he is an atheist. Also, DNC officials' emails showed that the, they conspired to show 
uh, the Sanders campaign to be unorganized. And Donna Brazil, who was current head of the DNC at that time, leaked primary debate questions to Clinton's campaign. So that'd be basically like if I have maybe a favorite number of students in my class and I give you the test questions without giving the others the questions, it's kind of unfair to you, right? Um, and unfair to the people I don't give the questions to. So, you know, I just wanted to show you this and, and have you see that I'm kind of going against what the author is saying in this instance. Bernie Sanders, again, in the 2020 primary, was gaining popular support before Biden declared his candidacy. Uh, Biden declared his candidacy and most of his other candidate, most of the other candidates dropped out and pledged support to Biden, therefore um, kind of... Um, and again, undercutting Bernie's um, support in 2020. The Republicans do it a little bit uh, more simple, simpler. Um, out of the 2,472 Republican delegates, most are pledged delegates, as with the Democratic Party. Um, to become the Republican nominee, you need a simple majority. Uh, winner take all in stage prior to 2012. Now a lot of states run proportional representation. They have very few unpledged delegates. Trump won the Republican primary in 2016. Uh, the Republicans did not hold a primary in 2020 as they automatically gave the nomination to Trump. Now there is some questions on whether or not we want to have an open primary versus a closed primary. A closed primary would be where you can only vote for candidates that belong to the same party as you. An open primary is where you can vote for anyone and the, anyone and the winner from each political party advances to the general election. So I want you to think to yourself, which would, you be, which would be preferable to you? An open primary or private closed primary? Um, there's been accusations that a lot of people in some of these primaries uh, that are leading up to the to the to 2022 midterm elections that a lot of people changed uh, party preference in order to be able to vote for another person in a closed primary and also in an open primary that they voted for maybe the uh, least electable candidate um, so their party could have an easier time to win the election. So kind of a really strategic way to do that as well. Um, you know, there's a desire to move, and we've already done it, to move uh, the primary from June to March for the presidential primary. So in 2024, we're going to have our presidential primary in March. It might cause candidates to focus on California a little bit more. In California's primary, we have modified open since 2011. Voters are allowed as individual citizens to vote for any candidate and the top two candidates regardless of party will advance to the general election in some local and state elections if a candidate wins a majority in the primary they will win the seat here we have party conventions where each party will have a convention where votes are tallied and the nominee is determined on the right is donald trump's kind of wwe entrance into the 2016 rnc and then uh joe biden speech acceptance speech is on the left not gonna watch it now obviously money drives elections much what, what we talked about in previous um lectures um campaign spending by all candidates uh the parties and independent co independent political organizations run about three billion dollars per election typical winning campaigns for the u.s senate can cost over 10 million dollars typical winning campaigns for the house of representatives cost over 1.5 million dollars in 2016 clinton raised 563 million and trump raised and spent 400 million now there's some kind of accusations about, you know, individual contributors and, you know, uh, feeding the fat cats. Only about half a percent of the U.S. adult population contributes $200 or more to campaigns. Uh, people who write checks for the legal maximum are fat cats. 
and you know this is generally maybe creates an unlevel playing field among the electorate where you know uh obviously people who make bigger donations might have uh, greater access to candidates as opposed to somebody that might buy a fifty dollar um you know a fifty dollar gift that or a fifty dollar um purchase that that fifty dollars is going to go to a campaign Buckley versus Vallejo is a Supreme Court decision that basically says that the Supreme Court will not limit the amount of money an individual can spend on their camp, uh, on their campaign. So whatever money you have that is yours, you can spend as much of as uh, much of it as you want on your campaign. So just kind of, you know, maybe it favors wealthy candidates, right? And kind of the belief is that this is an extension of the First Amendment right of free speech. Um, the Supreme Court has limited has allowed limitations on contributions, but not expenditures. And Buckley versus Vallejo is what we talked about. Okay, everybody. So I know this has been a a long kind of lecture. Uh, go back and and check some of the things that you might need clarifications. If you have any questions, definitely send me an email, and I can answer them. Okay, thanks a lot.